Thanks for joining everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining. Welcome. Uh, today we'll be talking about how to identify spotted lanternfly in Tree of Heaven and how to report to IMF invasives. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, people are muted automatically when you join this, but we will have the opportunity to for people to unmute and answer questions uh, and to ask questions at the end if you'd like. Um, and also, if you if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q and A feature. Um, that'll be at the bottom right or maybe bottom center, depending on uh, how you're viewing the webinar. Um, but somewhere you'll find that question mark icon, and you can type in questions um, that you have for the speakers. And so today speaking, we have Tom Algeyer, the invasive species coordinator at the Department of Ag and Markets. And also myself, Mitchell O'Neill. I'm the user support specialist for the IMAP Invasives team at the New York Natural Heritage Program. And for anyone uh, not familiar, uh, New York Natural Heritage Program um, is an organization um, housed in the in the DEC office at um, in Albany. Um, and our mission is to facilitate conservation of New York's biodiversity by providing comprehensive information and scientific expertise on rare species and natural ecosystems to resource natural resource managers and other conservation partners. And we're a partnership between DEC and the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And since invasive species are such a threat to biodiversity and rare species, we also manage the invasive species database for the state. And with that, thank you all so much for joining, um, and I'll get into uh, what we'll be covering today. So I'll give a quick introduction to this project, and then we'll hear from Tom Algeyer from Ag and Markets on Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven, and then I'll give a brief IMAP Invasives overview. So many of you are, are probably somewhat familiar with Spotted Lanternfly. Um, it's this invasive species um, that we've had in the Northeast for a couple of years now. Um, it feeds on many important plant species, including ecologically important native species and also crop species, particularly grapevines. Um, and for example, it could have very large economic impacts, um, and there's also some nuisance impacts of the the lanternfly is swarming and producing honeydew, um, but I'll I'll just leave it at that brief um, overview for now because we'll hear from Tom in just a couple of minutes who can give a lot more information. And so, spy lanternfly is uh, poses these issues to New York State. Um, but luckily, we have a network of professionals and volunteers all working together to monitor and hopefully slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. So this involves pretty much everyone. So state agencies, nonprofits, volunteers, the general public. Um, so people like you, um, ed everybody can help with this effort and contribute data where they look for spotted lanternfly, whether or not you find it, um, and if you do find it by, by posting photos and IMAP invasives, um, those can be reviewed by natural resource professionals and help us keep tabs on the distribution of spotted lanternfly in real time. And just to give a snapshot of uh, where things are so far this year, um, so towards the end of the webinar, I'll talk about our claim a grid square claim a grid square program where volunteers can claim a location to survey for spotted lanternfly and its host plant tree of heaven a couple of times throughout the year. Um, so this map is just showing um, data that's been put into IMAP this year. Um, Tom will later on show a map of the official distribution of spotted lanternfly. This is just our IMAP reports for the year so far. Um, so you can see these Purple dot, purple squares are locations where volunteers have claimed um, to conduct surveys. And then the green points and the yellow, the green points are spotted lanternfly detections, and the yellow points are areas where people have gone out, checked for spotted lanternfly, and not found it yet. 
Um, so you can see we have people signing up across the state and also submitting their records across the state. Um, we already have uh, thousands of records all together um, this year. Um, but even with all these efforts currently underway, um, you can see there are blank spots on the map and we do have about 3,000 locations that are still up for grabs. So we'd be really happy um, to have more volunteers participate as well. Um, so hopefully some of you might be interested by the end of the webinar. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tom to talk about Spotted Lanternfly. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, again, I'm Tom Algeyer, uh, New York State Department of Agriculture Markets. I am the Invasive Species Coordinator within the Division of Plant Industry. So, um, next slide. Thanks. Um, for more information, um, you can always visit our departmental website for spotted lanternfly. We have a page dedicated um, specifically to spotted lanternfly. It's very uh, broad. Uh, for more detailed information, there's always the, the Cornell Integrated Pest Management site, which I'll, I'll get to that later. So, next page. So, spotted lanternfly uh, is a plant hopper native to China and parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, it was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014 in Berks County and has slowly spread outward from there since. Um, it uses piercing sucking mouth parts similar to a straw. Think of, think of it like a mosquito, uh, very similar mouth parts. Um, so they, they pierce the plants and they kind of filter the, the sap through them. They don't really suck it out. It, it's the plant pressure that pushes the sap through them. Um, more on that later when I talk about honeydew. Um, they feed on over 100 different plants that we know of. They prefer tree of heaven. Alanthus altissima, which is also an invasive species. Uh, but what they damage, what we're concerned about is damage to crops like grapes, hop, hops, apples, maples, walnuts, and uh, many other plants. Next page. Uh, as far as their, their impacts, besides the economic and agricultural impacts, um, their feeding stresses plants, making them vulnerable, vulnerable to other diseases and attacks from other insects. Um, they excrete uh, a sugary-rich substance called honeydew. So it's partially sap, partially their excrement, and uh, this sugary substance will attract stinging insects, uh, specifically in the fall. Uh, we're starting to see that now in some areas uh, of, the, of the state. Uh, but wasps and hornets and yellow jackets and things like that, even honeybees, are attracted to this honeydew. Uh, however, if you've ever grown roses, you're familiar with uh, honeydew from, from aphids. A very similar uh, issue there where you get black sooty mold growing on anything underneath of it that has the sooty mold, uh, the, sorry, that has the honeydew on it. Uh, and that, and the photos there, the top left corner shows some steps. The bottom step has been power washed and it gives you a comparison of how that black, slick, wet looking mess on the step that's the, the the sooty mold growing on the uh, on the honeydew. Um, the sap dripping down can also start to ferment, and you can see that some of that fungal growth at the base of this tree that is also covered with adults. Um, again, bottom left and bottom right, you can see some of the honeydew, uh, the black sooty mold growing on the honeydew on plants and on the ground. It doesn't necessarily it's, not necessarily always on a plant. It could be an inanimate object like a vehicle or outdoor patio furniture, barbecue grill, your deck, things like that. So uh, it's a nuisance pest, particularly in urban and suburban areas. Next page. Uh, one of the things I want to back up, we don't have to change the slide, but one other thing I want to mention is with their piercing, sucking mouth parts, they do not sting, they do not bite, they're not venomous or poisonous to humans, um, but they are a nuisance. Um, so we're concerned about vineyard losses Nationally, New York ranks third in grape production and also uh, second in, in apple production. So you can hopefully understand why that would be such an economic impact or an economic loss to New York State um, if these uh, were to start causing widespread damage. There are environmental impacts that aren't exactly understood yet as far as uh, forests and forest regeneration and uh, forest products, whether it be timber regrowth of uh, sugar maple trees, maple production, uh, maple sugar production, things like that. Um, 
So we're not sure what those impacts are going to be quite yet. Again, you can see an adult, and you can see the glossy, shiny leaves there. Um, that is, again, the sooty mold. Uh, sorry, honeydew. Um, the sooty mold is black, but the, uh, the honeydew is going to be white. Looks almost like uh, rain coming down in broad daylight. So next page. So where it's at. So as of just the other day, um, this is the current map. In New York County, 20, 20 of these blue counties are shaded in. doesn't mean the entire county is infested, um, like Tompkins County. It's located to a very small area on and adjacent to the, uh, the Ithaca uh, um, campus there uh, for, for Cornell. So it's not the entire county, but a, a location in that county does have a viable population. So the counties are shaded in blue. Um, you'll see a couple of counties there that have little purplish red dots. And those are locations where, where one insect has been found or, or an egg mass has been found, but no viable population. Um, a lot of those are associated with goods being shipped around, things like that, uh, dead insects that were found in packaging and such. Um, one change that's coming to this map, I know it says 20 counties in New York. It's really 22. Um, Duchess and Putnam will be soon be shaded in. Uh, we had a discussion about that this morning. Um, I thought that was going to happen in the last map update, and it did not. But uh, in the coming weeks, those other additional two counties kind of sandwiched between the, the positive counties in Connecticut and the other part on the western side of the Hudson. Um, those counties have had um, multiple life stages reported in both counties. Uh, we, we're just waiting to collect an official sample at this point. So even this map that was produced nine days ago is uh, a little bit out of date. So, but you can see how far and wide it's spread. You know, it's in 15 states at this point. Uh, so, and again, it, it started right about here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, probably not. But the the eastern third of Pennsylvania, kind of in the cent, you know, north the central part there, is Berks County, and it, it's pretty much the center part of that that blue area. And it, it's definitely spreading out, whether by its own means or by hitchhiking. It's certainly spread quite a bit in the last nine years. However, um, efforts by all the states and the USDA and others have really slowed down the spread, and that's at the point where that's what we're attempting to do at this point. So, next page. So, we're, at this point, we're we're seeing adults in, in all the areas that we know where there are populations, uh, and here's what some of the adults look like. Often, you see this beautiful moth-looking photo. You're not likely to see that in the environment. This is what you're more likely to see with their wings folded and getting ready to hop and getting ready to launch off the stem if they're disturbed. Uh, typically, the, the, the reddish color of their hind wings shines through, kind of comes through, and they look slightly pinkish with black dots. So, next page. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned with, especially this time of year, is uh, you can see this. This pickup truck here, the, the door pillar with the spot lantern fly just waiting to jump through that open window. That's what we're concerned with is, is accidental movement this time of year. On the right side, you have a, another a dorsal view or top view of the uh, spot lantern fly. So that when their wings are folded, they you know um, that's typically where you're going to see them. But um, if they're flat against the tree, this might be more of the view you see. And you can see more of that pinkish hue coming through there their, uh, from their hind wings. So. Next page. Uh, nymphs are still active, particularly the, the fourth instar nymphs with the, uh, the red wing pads. Uh, these are very, very easily to spot in the, in the environment. They're about the size of a dime. Uh, and they're very colorful, very pretty insect, uh, however destructive. So, next page. Again, here you can see some more of the uh, fourth instar nymphs on Japanese knotweed on the left there. Beautiful photo uh, taken by one of the prison partner uh, contributors, and then also Luke Duras, and then also um, mixed life stages on what appears to be. Um, it looks like a wild grapevine to me, um, but there's an adult and, and several uh, fourth instar nymphs. So you can see those mixed life stages at this point in, uh, of the year. So, next page. 
uh, just get a quick look at the uh, life cycle. Uh, right now, we're currently kind of towards the the top half of that life cycle. Uh, definitely seeing adults. Definitely seeing fourth in-store adults. Uh, sorry, fourth in-store nymphs. And very soon, we'll start to see egg masses. Uh, however, uh, there have been no reported egg masses in New York State for this year yet, uh, but I'm sure they're coming very soon. Probably the end of uh, September, we'll start to see egg masses. Uh, so we're another few weeks. So after you've participated in this webinar, if you're out there looking, don't think, oh, I just have to look for adults and nymphs. Uh, we're definitely transitioning uh, from one season to another. Uh, you're not likely to see uh, the early instar nymphs at this stage, this time of year. Most of the eggs have hatched and they've they've progressed past that stage. But there might still be a few late bloomers, uh, and you'll see the black and white earlier, you know, first, second, and third instar nymphs. There might be a few of those still out there, but you're more likely to see um, the adults and the fourth instar nymphs at this period. So, next page. It's kind of just another visual, the same thing I was just explaining. Kind of the very, very tail end of the third instar nymphs, fourth instar nymphs and adults. And, uh, you know, into September we'll start seeing eggs. But we have another month, uh, about another month for that, uh, depending on the weather. Although emergence was a few weeks, two or three weeks early in New York State than we anticipated. So possibly egg masses might start two or three months, uh, two or three weeks rather, earlier as well. Uh, and here on the left side, you can see all four life stages. Uh, again, that top view of the spiral butterfly. So, and the other two nymphs, they, they, that, they, that perching posture where they're about to launch themselves. They, they are plant hoppers and they hop in all life stages except for the eggs. They are very, very good at launching themselves off of things. So, next page. Um, in a few weeks, we'll start to see gravid females females that are ready to lay eggs. On the left side, she's very gravid. <laughs> You'll start to see that yellow marking, uh, which we don't see when they're, before they've mated, um, but as their abdomen starts to uh, expand uh, due to the egg mass, uh, the eggs inside that they're producing, um, those platelets start to unfold, and, uh, and you see more of that yellow visible on the females. Uh, very clearly on the right-hand side, um, however, you know, the one in the plastic water bottle there is still pretty evident that she's very, very close to laying eggs. So that was a good catch by whoever caught that. So next page. Uh, egg masses, which we're not seeing right now, but we will shortly, are very easily camouflaged. They look like a smear of mud or chalk. Uh, well, they, they sometimes get confused for, for uh, spongy moth eggs, but however, the spongy moth eggs look more like paper mache almost like a cardboard type material where the spotted lantern fly eggs are, look more like putty or mud. Um, here you can see this uh, egg mass. I hope you can see the egg mass in the center there on the uh, Atlantis tree. Next slide. There it is. It's kind of camouflaged pretty well. So they are hard to, are, are hard to spot, uh, particularly when they're up in the tree canopy and it's not a, not a bright sunny day. If it's a little bit cloudy out, um, they get very difficult to see, especially up higher in the canopy. So next page. And they like to hide their egg masses in protected cavities and underneath of things and on the underside of structures and obstacle uh, objects. Uh, here's some cat facing on a, on a tree that was some damage that had happened prior. Um, and under that peeling bark, back in the corner where you, you know, wouldn't see it looking straight at the tree, but there's a freshly laid egg mass uh, in that little cavity under that peel of bark. So things to look out for when uh, when you're surveying. You know, you really got to take a, a look at all all angles. And you can't just look straight at the tree. So next page. Um, here you have an idea of you know, size of the egg mass next to the female. The females are about three quarters to an inch long. Uh, they typically lay, uh, lay eggs and then cover them. However, there is a percentage of egg masses that don't get covered for whatever reason. Uh, either they don't have enough resources or uh, nutrients or they're just being lazy. We, we don't, that's not really understood why, but uh, there's certainly a percentage of egg masses that, left, that are left uncovered. The uncovered egg masses look almost like sesame seeds. Uh, oh, sorry, caraway seeds glued to a tree, um, and they have a, a little line down their center. Um, 
if they look like they've been opened up and they're kind of hollow in the center, they've hatched their, their grasses from last year or the year before. Uh, however, um, you're unlikely to see those due to weathering and time and age uh, this time of year. If you do start seeing egg masses, they're very much likely to be uh, egg masses from this year. Um, again, you can see the covered egg mass in the top just above the female. It blends in really, really well into that bark. Uh, you can see how that would blend in with many things. It just looks like a little smudge of mud. So, Next page. They like uh, laying eggs on rusty metal in protected areas. So for whatever reason, they're definitely attracted to, to rusty metal. So this uh, car tire and rim were uh, laying on the ground. Somebody lifted it up to look underneath the underside, and lo and behold, all these circled egg masses were found, typically um, the ones on the rusty metal. Again, on the left side, you can see that the, the egg masses uh, that are uncovered and also one that's partially covered. And uh, the covered egg mass in the, in the center photo is starting to age a little bit and starting to get cracked. It looks more like putty than mud, uh, but it has that, you know, it, it changes color over time is really the point I'm trying to make. When they're first covered, it looks very white, and then it turns like a tannish color, and then it kind of fades to gray and dried and cracked as time goes on. So, next page. Again, um, covered and uncovered, you can see that grayish egg mass. You can see sap dripping down the tree, and so there's, there's probably feeding still going on in the upper canopy. The metal barrel there, uh, the, you know, they could see egg masses underneath that little lip, um, both of them, and then when they fill that spot there, um, you know, they, they kind of go adjacent to it. Typically, you won't find just one egg mass. You'll find multiple egg masses. It's not understood why, but um, when a female lays eggs in a spot, others are attracted to that spot as well. So that does aid in detection, um, especially when the population is a little bit higher. Uh, obviously, the area around this barrel has a high population, but there's quite a few egg masses. So, next page. Again, the uh, things that uh, places to look would be the underside of things, so the back of this tractor trailer. I don't know nothing on the sides, but you look underneath that tail light housing, that protecting ring, and there's egg masses all over that, uh, but nothing on the top side. Uh, the railroad track here. The, uh, the bottom side of the, the, the railroad track rail has an egg mass that was detected by one of the dogs from the uh, lower Hudson, uh, one of the lower Hudson detector dogs. I believe it was Dia, the dog, uh, but they're trained in detecting spotted lantern fly. Uh, very difficult spot for humans to survey, even with an inspectional mirror, uh, just very time and labor intensive, or the, the dogs do a much better job in that environment. Uh, things that we worry about are like this camp chair that was laying on the ground, and again, they, they laid the eggs on the protected underside of the, of the camp chair. Someone picked up the camp chair, and lo and behold, you know, egg masses. So very easily that could be picked up, put in your camper, and taken to the cabin, taken fishing, hiking, on your vacation, um, you know, concert, whatever, uh, any place you'd want to bring this chair to, and easily spread spotted lantern fly, and not just chairs, but other recreational equipment like kayaks, boats, things like that, uh, can very easily accidentally transport spotted lantern fly. So keep those things in mind um, when you're traveling and also when you're surveying. So, next page. So my take-home messages for spotted lantern fly. Um, you know, from this picture here, it's just the beautiful insect. But currently, we're looking for the adults and the fourth instar nymphs. You know, the black and white spots with the red patches like you've seen earlier. Um, flat, protected areas, basically under and behind things are great places to look. Rusty metal objects are, are great places to look for uh, spotted lantern fly. And uh, don't be discouraged if, uh, if you have negative survey results. You know, if you go out and look and look and look and don't find anything, we need to know that as well because if you're surveying those areas and there's nothing's being found, that's very important to us also so we can direct our survey and direct our resources. So negative is not always bad. And when it comes to the survey and you're looking for something as destructive as, as this, negative is good. So negative survey is good. I can't stress that enough, even with our own folks. So, so. next page. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, looks like we do have one question. So 
might throw that in now, um, but I'll also rem remind everyone um, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please put type those into the Q and A. You should see a question mark icon um, for mm -hmm. the Q and A. Um, it, sometimes near the chat box, you might have to click a dot 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 more to to access it. Um, so I'll read the one that we have right now. Um, so. So it has been shocking to find infestations at office buildings and apartments, apartment buildings along Douglaston, which I believe is in Queens. Um, is there anything that can be done about this sort of thing? Um, several things can be done. Uh, we're no longer asking people in New York City, Nassau County, or Westchester to report them because we're well aware of the populations there and that um, and the and the volume of populations that are there. Um, so that slows us down from responding to populations in areas where we don't know it is where it's spreading to and also where there is agricultural production areas that we're most concerned with. Um, not that we're not concerned with those areas, we are, but our resources are being directed to the areas where we can be more effective. Um, so uh, reporting it, uh, for the, at least for New York City, Westchester, Nassau County, um, we know it's there, no need to further report. Uh, we do have some some handouts, some literature that's available uh, with information, but the best place would be the integrated pest management site from Cornell for spotted lanternfly. And as far as what can be done, again, that same website, I'll, I'll post it later in the chat, uh, there are recommendations for management. Uh, you could always report spotted lanternfly and IMAP invasives. That's another uh, great way to do it. Um, we can track those reports as well uh, that all gets integrated into our survey and treatment and management uh, data. Uh, as far as uh, specific management, um, there's there's trapping, there's vacuuming, there's scraping egg masses, there, there's stepping and squishing on adults, and there's also um, there's chemical options as well. So, uh, but those specific recommendations for property manage, property owners to manage spot and fly on their own properties are all listed on that integrated pest management site. So. I hope that answers all parts of that question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, I think we'll move on to the next section for now, um, but the, those questions are being stored in the Q&A, so if there's anything that gets asked um, that we didn't get to yet, um, we'll we'll have the opportunity to go through those again um, at the end of the webinar. Um, so thanks, Tom, for that great SLF overview, and now we'll switch to Tree of Heaven. Sure. Um, I I mentioned Tree of Heaven earlier. It is another invasive introduced here into the United States. Uh, it was brought in to the United, to North America in 1748. Uh, early plantings were based in Pennsylvania, but they've since moved westward as settlers moved west. Um, you know, they were looking for plants that would that could produce, grow very quickly and produce shade, uh, things like that. Um, it was also thought that it would be a host for silk moth, which that didn't exactly work out. Um, it's also the tree that was featured in the novel, uh, a tree grows in Brooklyn. So some people uh, in Brooklyn in particular, or people that are fans of, the, of, the, of Betty Smith's novel, uh, have a particular affinity to this tree, and it will really grow anywhere. Um, it's just a, a nuisance tree in most locations. So. Next page. Uh, so Tree of Heaven, its native range is central China and Taiwan. Again, um, spotted lanternfly in you know, backyard as well. Uh, so they've kind of uh, developed together in the same locations. So it, it's not surprising that when it came here to the United States that its uh, favorite food was something that it was used to and, uh, in its native land. Um, Tree of Heaven tolerates very poor soils sandy soils, gravelly, construction material kind of stuff. Uh, grows well in urban settings, uh, heat islands, cracks of sidewalks, things like that. Many, many different habitat types. Uh, but it does need some uh, light, um, you know, open areas where there's a lot of light to, to grow really aggressively. And unfortunately, once it's established, it's very drought tolerant. Uh, its impacts, well, it crowds out native invasive species with, you know, dense uh, colonies of plants. Um, and then they shade out uh, all the things growing in the understory. Um, and it also has some aleopathic compounds that also, so the roots exude this uh, 
chemical compound that, that prohibits other plants from growing and other seeds from establishing. So it changes the nutrients uh, cycling in, in the in the soil, uh, mostly because it um, again it shades out the the understory plants. Uh, so now it's the only plant contributing to to leaf litter. Uh, it really changes nutrients cycling that way. Uh, it can damage buildings with its roots, buildings and sidewalks, and walls and things like that. Uh, again, it'll, it'll grow in a crack of a sidewalk, and then as the roots expand and grow, um, it'll crack that concrete. Uh, it's a pretty tough plant. Uh, and unfortunately, it is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. It's not the only host, but it's the preferred host. And uh, spotted lanternfly um, that feed on Tree of Heaven, they fare much better. Uh, they're more reproductive. They're, they're healthier and have more vigor. However, uh, they can complete their life cycle on other plants. Next page. Uh, the growth form, I mentioned earlier that they kind of grow in colonies. Uh, they, they produce roots uh, and then they, they root graft. And then, so it's not just one tree, it's a, it's a clump of trees that are really all just one organism. However, they do produce a copious amount of seed and those seeds can, can start new colonies and new plants and those seeds can be carried around. Uh, but they're often seen growing in groups and clumps. Uh, especially if it's a longer established population. And they can get quite large. They can get up to about 80 feet tall. Um, you don't often see them that high, um, particularly in this area. Um, they're not the strongest wooded tree. So in storms, they often have a lot of damage. Um, but they do grow very, very quickly. Uh, that's part of where they get their, their common name from. So they do grow very fast. So next page. One of the telltale signs to identifying a tree of heaven compared to some of the other things that are look alike. Um, so leaf arrangement is typically either alternate, opposite, or world, where the leaflets are, uh, the leaves come off the base of the stem, um, either staggered or directly across or in a world pattern. Um, tree of heaven is an alternate leaf pattern. And then each leaflet has a little notch or a little nub, thumb, whatever you want to call it, at the, uh, the base of the uh, the, the bottom part of the leaf, where the leaf, uh, the, the, where, the, where the leaf meets the leaf stem, the petiole. Um, the other plants that are similar to this, whether it's ash or black walnut, do not have this little notch or or, uh, or sumac. So if you're looking at one of the individual leaflets and it has that particular notch or that little thumb, uh, that's a, a telltale sign that you're looking at tree of heaven. Also, the the, uh, the stems of the leaflets are, are have that burgundy color, that reddish color to them, oftentimes. So. Next page. Again, here you can see the pinnately compound leaf. So, pinnately means just it's uh, the, the the leaf pattern on each leaf. So, each one of these pictures is one single leaf with leaflets coming off the stem. So, next page. Again, you can see the leaflet and then that little notch. There's also a tiny little gland at the, on the underside of the tip of that notch. Um, so if you really, really want to get in there and look, um, you can flip over the leaf and look for that gland at the base. Next page. Uh, it, they do produce a copious amount of seeds. Believe that, that top center photo there, you can see all that that brown. Those aren't brown leaves, those are all seed pods. So very similar Samaras to, uh, to ash. Uh, walnut, no, no, sorry, walnut. Maple has uh, Samaras also, but you're, typically they're two-sided. Uh, these look a lot more similar to ash. And the they, coloring can be variable. When they, when they first start to develop, they have this reddish hue to them, and then they'll turn green, and then as they start to dry out in the fall, uh, early winter, they'll have this brownish texture to them, and then they'll drop. Next page. The stems, uh, if you break, break off the, one, of the, one of the plant stems on the tree of heaven at the end, um, they're hollow, they have pith, um, so it's a, a soft substance in the center of the, uh, of the twig, um, it's not a solid twig, and it gives off a smell of burnt peanut butter um, and they're kind of, it's kind of a brownish tan on the inside. Uh, it's not rot, it's actually just the, the plant structure. So, next page. 
The bark, when they're young in particular, looks almost like cantaloupe skin, um, slightly textured, but mostly smooth. Um, when they get older, the bark can be quite chunky and, and blocky, but uh, typically what you see is trees uh, with this very smooth cantaloupe-like skin, um, which is easily distinguished from, from some other younger trees that are similar, like black walnut. So, Next page. As far as the twigs go, uh, other than breaking them off and looking at the inside, looking at the leaf scars, uh, there's multiple things we can look at to identify Tree of Heaven. Uh, they have a, a smooth grayish color, like a chestnut brown color. Uh, the leaf scar is in a heart shape. Uh, you can see that pretty clearly on the, the photo in the center of the page there. Uh, a smaller bud at the top, kind of at the, uh, the, the bottom part, like the, the the crevice, I guess you'd call it, of the heart, and the heart-shaped bud scar, um, and then there'll be vascular dots below that. Um, the walnut, the buds are very small compared to, you know, the leaf scars are very small compared to Tree of Heaven. Again, sumac too, uh, very angular stems. Uh, the, the, the buds and the leaf scars are very small. Horse chestnut, however, has a uh, very large uh, uh, buds, but the leaf scars are, are similar, but they're not heart-shaped. So, next page. So, uh, as you can see, Tree of Heaven next to uh, Sumac, where the, the Tree of Heaven slightly alternates on, on the stem. Sumac is directly opposite of each other. Also, they don't have that, uh, that, that notch at the base of their leaflets. The stem on the sumacs are typically uh, reddish, where only the, the leaf stem, the petiole, is, uh, has that reddish coloring on Tree of Heaven. After, tree, uh, after sumac uh, blooms, they have these persistent seed heads or cones uh, that look very different um, from, from the, the seeds on uh, Tree of Heaven. Uh, the stems, again, in that bottom center picture, very flat, very angular, uh, where the Tree of Heaven stems are very round. Uh, very consistent, very uniform. And uh, the picture on the right, you can see sumac growing nice and lush and full in the bottom, and then a tree of heaven behind it. Uh, typically, sumac uh, doesn't, it won't gain the height. It's an understory plant. It's not going to gain the height that tree of heaven does. However, a, a clump of small, younger tree of heaven can easily be, you know, can be confused with uh, a clump of uh, sumac. Next page. Some of the lookalikes uh, are walnut, uh, particularly when they're younger, uh, three, four foot tall, spotted lantern fly, especially the earlier nymphs, you know, first, second, third instar nymphs, will be covering the walnut and ignore the uh, tree of heaven until they get older. Uh, they, they, they really seem to be attracted to young walnut trees. However, um, they do not have the uh, the heart-shaped leaf scars. Uh, these look almost like a uh, almost like a tongue to me. Uh, the buds are much smaller, the leaf buds. Uh, the fruit that falls in the ground has that green uh, mesocarp, uh, which turns to brown as it starts to rot, and then the nuts themselves. Um, they don't look like the English walnuts you find in the store. These are very, uh, um, the pattern on the outside is not very smooth. They're very uh, textured. Uh, but the fruit from the from black walnut is very distinguishable from uh, the the seed pods on a tree of heaven. Again, uh, the the leaflets are much fatter, and they don't have the that uh, gland on the other side of the notch. Um, so, but they do have pinnate leaves. So. Next page. Another thing that looks very similar is ash. Uh, however, the uh, and the seeds also look very similar to ash, but the uh, ash leaflets will have either five or seven uh, leaflets per section. Uh, Tree of Heaven is much longer, more uh, tropical looking when it's growing. Um, and again, I can't stress enough looking for that notch at the base of the leaf. Uh, you can see the, the ash leaf that's flipped over with the with the uh, seven leaflets. They don't have that notch at the base of the leaf, leaflet 
as it attaches to the stem. So, next page. Uh, again, the, the ash uh, seeds look very similar to a tree of heaven. However, if you have one of the individual seeds for tree of heaven, the seed is actually in the middle of the of the seed pod, where ash is at the base, closest to the the, the, the stem of the leaf, uh, stem of the seed, where it would attach to the plant. Um, the ash seeds, when they're dried and hanging from a tree, are smaller and, and very dense, where the tree of heaven seed pods are still fairly dense but much larger and a little bit more spread out, if that makes sense. The uh, so when they're in the tree and, and you're looking up at them. It's a little harder to, to distinguish which is which, um, but if you have the individual seeds, it's very easy to determine one from the other based on where the actual seed is in the Samara. So, next page. So the take home messages for this plant, for this part of the issue, uh, would be to check your plants, whether they're a tree of heaven or not. Um, look for, for signs of the damage, look for you know, uh, signs of the insects, look for uh, sooty mold, look for uh, honeydew. Again, Tree of Heaven is a preferred host from spotted lanternfly, but there are many, many host plants. There's over 100 different plants they feed on. Tree of Heaven is just their favorite food. Um, very much like people, you know, if steak's not around, they might eat the spam. But if they're, you know, if, if again, you know, Atlantis would be their steak. So, next page. Um, so here is that. Uh, Integrated Pest Management Site link. I'll also put it in the chat box. That's the one in the center of the page. Um, I can be reached through my email. And then also, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the very beginning, uh, we have a Spotted Lanternfly page on our uh, New York State Ag and Markets um, web page and for dedicated just for Spotted Lanternfly information. But it's very broad. Uh, very detailed information can be found at the, uh, the IPM site from Cornell. Thanks so much, Tom. And uh, yeah, so Tom mentioned that he's going to put the link in the, the chat box so that people can access that link. Um, so thanks so much for that overview of Tree of Heaven, too. Um, and uh, everyone feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll make sure those are all answered at the end. Um, but for right now, I will do, do my, my quick IMAP overview and then we'll get to um, wrapping up any questions. So IMAP Invasives is the centralized invasive species database. Uh, it's used by PRISMS in New York. So those are the partnerships for regional invasive species management. There's one, uh, so New York State is divided into these eight regions, which are hubs for invasive species information and management, um, and also state agencies and other partners working on invasive species issues. Um, so IMAP has the capacity for re reporting species and also looking at species distributions. Um, there are also email alerts that can be set up for people to get alerts of new species in an area of interest um, and more. So there's a, uh, so IMAP Invasives is this data, database for invasive species, and there's a couple of different types of data that can be collected in here. So there's presence data, so species that were found in a certain location. There's also not detected data, so those indicate where a species was looked for but not found. Um, and Tom mentioned earlier that that information can be very useful. Um, so to see that you checked for spotted lanternfly in a certain location and did not find it, um, that can be very useful and also uh, treatment, um, but I won't talk much about that today because um, there isn't really um, a need for reporting treatment information for the uh, program that we're talking about today. Um, and in presence records, there's um, actually a couple of different types of presence records too. So there's confirmed records, which have been reviewed and verified, um, often using the photograph that's attached to a record. And then there are also unconfirmed records. Um, so if if a record of Tree of Heaven is submitted right now, it'll go in as unconfirmed and it will wait until someone goes in and reviews it. Um, one of our partners goes in and reviews it and then it will become confirmed. Um, and I also wanted to note that there are some records that are um, hidden from the public view. 
So for example, um, spot lander fly records, when they go in unconfirmed, they are initially not visible on the map, um, but once they are confirmed, then they go onto the public map. And just to reiterate that, so for Retrieve Heaven records, those go in as unconfirmed. Um, anyone who logs into IMAP can look at those. And then uh, email alerts go out to our partners who help confirm records, and they then review the photos and confirm the records as needed. So those then go onto our public map. And then for Spotted Lanternfly, those start out as confidential. So the email alerts go to um, our partners at Eigen Markets, like Tom. Um, and then they then review the, the photos and confirm those records as needed. Um, and then they are on our public map for the state. And so uh, one thing I wanted to talk about today was um, this volunteer mapping program. Um, so this came from us recognizing that New York State really needs help monitoring spotted lanternfly. Um, so there, there's a network of partners and agencies that are doing great work to monitor spy lanternfly, but New York State is huge. Um, there's always more ground than we can cover. So it, it's really helpful to have help, um, more eyes on the ground. And um, if we get a network of volunteers um, serving as more eyes on the ground and reporting um, where they are, it's very important that that data also goes into a centralized database um, where eigenmarkets can review those reports um, and the data can all kind of be in one place. Um, and one thing we also realized was that we needed to direct volunteer efforts to locations that will best complement the statewide efforts already underway. Um, so for example, um, there are certain areas in the state where um, professional surveys are already being undertaken, so volunteer help is not necessarily uh, super needed in those areas, but maybe we do need a lot of help just outside of those areas where a spotted lanternfly could be spreading, um, but we don't have staff to survey. Um, and so what came out of that was um, we came up with this volunteer program. It was pretty much four steps. Um, so volunteers set up an IMAP account, they claim a grid square to survey, and I forgot to update that slide, um, but it's a year long commitment. So if you sign up, it's a, it's a, you're signing up to survey for the 2023 um, year. Um, and then the volunteers prep for the surveys in those grid squares, and then they actually go out and do the surveys. And we encourage people to try to do at least one survey in each of our survey seasons. And so we've roughly divided the year up into these three seasons. So spring, um, which um, has come and gone, and then the summer season, which started July 1st and goes through the end of this month, and then the fall season, which goes from September to November. The idea is that when people claim a location to survey, they would um, do a survey in as many of these seasons as they can. So at this point, um, signing up, we would be hoping that people would uh, do one survey um, before the end of the month um, and then one survey in the fall. And if, even if uh, they sign up, you know, in late August and don't get to their surveys until September or something, that's fine too. Even one, one survey throughout the year is still helpful. And so step one um, for anyone who wants to, to, uh, join IMAP is to set up an IMAP Invasives account. So you do that by going to our website at nyimapinvasives.org. And there's a login button at the top right. And this brings you to our account creation portal. Um, so if you already have an account, you can put in that info at the top. Um, there's a forgot password option if you think you have an account but you haven't been able to get in. Um, and if you're having any issues, you can always contact us. Um, if you have never created an account, you can create one for free um, right underneath that login bar. Um, so just put in your information, like your name, your email, make a password, and then choose New York for your jurisdiction. Um, and that creates your account. 
Um, but to activate your account, make sure you check your email inbox um, for that account activation link. Um, sometimes that ends up in a junk or spam folder, depending on your email settings. So if you're not seeing it, make sure you check there. And again, feel free to contact us if you have any issues creating your account. But once you create your account, you'll be able to log in. And this is what the interface looks like. Um, I'll briefly show you where some things are, but um, in general, you don't necessarily have to worry too much about the online interface um, to participate in this volunteer program or to report invasive species. It's just kind of um, if you would like to view the data or see which species are in your area, um, see where spot landerfly has been reported, that sort of thing. Um, so one thing I will point out is that if you go to the Your Account uh, button from the main menu on the top left, you can see your uh, person ID, which is your unique identifier in IMAP, and we ask people to put that in when you sign up for a grid square, which I'll mention in a second. Um, and also just to show you a couple things in the website, um, so there's the main menu on the top left. There's navigation uh, tools on the left-hand side, like zooming in, zooming out, typing in an address. Um, there's map uh, layer options on the right side, so you can change your base map, you can turn on different layers. And then at the top, there's action tools, um, like filtering on a species you're interested in. And then if you wanna sign up for a grid square, um, our, the grid square map is at our SLF webpage, so nyimapinvasives.org slash SLF. And um, it's this sign up map that you can go into. You can put in your address or you can navigate on the map um, and see what grid squares are open for sign up in your area. Um, so essentially, our partners, so Ag and Markets, uh, state parks, the PRISMs, and the New York Natural Heritage Program selected one kilometer grid squares across the state where volunteer survey efforts would be most helpful to complement the statewide efforts underway. And so there's a couple of different reasons why certain uh, grid squares became open for sign up. So focus areas, uh, those reddish squares are hand selected by Ag and Markets. So those are sort of, those are often kind of high, high probability areas where spotted lanternfly might pop up if it was in the region, um, but also areas that are not already being surveyed by ag and markets. Um, and then there, there are also, and those are kind of, those focus areas are kind of the, the top priorities. So if you see one of those in your area that you're willing to go survey, we really encourage you to pick that one. Um, but there are also a bunch of other places where we're looking for people to survey. Um, so there are yellow squares, which were handpicked by PRISMs as places where they'd like volunteers to survey. And then we also have purple squares, which are areas where a tree of heaven is already known. So those are good places to check for spotted lanternfly. Those are places spotted lanternfly would be attracted to if they make it to your region. And then also there are blue grid squares, which are um, areas that are publicly accessible. Um, not all publicly accessible areas, just ones that we, we know of from our um, kind of statewide view. Um, and so if you go in and look at these areas and there maybe isn't one super close to you, or maybe you already have had in mind a local park that maybe didn't make it onto our map or something, um, that's totally okay. So we kind of picked these areas from our uh, kind of broad view. Um, you, with your local knowledge, you might know of other places to survey, um, and we would totally accept that data too. So if, if there's somewhere else you want to survey, please feel free to participate in this program. You'll just skip the step of claiming a grid square and kind of do your, your surveys on your own. And one thing we encourage people to do is think about your IMAP reporting beforehand. So if you um, test it out beforehand, figure out how it works, then you'll have a really easy time when you go out into the field. Um, and we're mainly recommending people use our mobile app, which you can find in the App Store. Um, so I'll talk very briefly about that. 
Um, so basically, it's this workflow where you, while you have internet, you set up your, well, I already mentioned how to set up your IMAP account. So what, when you are in the internet, you do that, and then you also download the app and get it configured. And then once you've done that, um, you can then go record invasive species. Um, in theory, you don't actually need to be collect connected to the internet. Um, it just uses your phone's GPS. And then when you get back home and you have internet connection again, then you upload those records to IMAP. And so you can search the IMAP Invasives mobile app in your app store, um, and it'll come up. Um, it's published by SUNY ESF. And so once you download that, um, you just do the, the setup, which is just putting your username and password in and your state, and then clicking the retrieve IMAP lists button. Um, so you can kind of see, see that shown here on this first screen. So you open, you download the app, and then you put in your state, your email that you signed up for IMAP with, and your password, and then click retrieve IMAP lists. And then um, we have this option that you can use to test out reporting. Um, so if you go to add observation, you can then, uh, you get into the add observation screen and you can actually select a species called fake species for testing. And so that allows you to submit these sort of fake reports to IMAP invasives just to make sure you understand how the reporting works and make sure your records go in and everything. Um, Cause it's a lot easier to figure that out while you're practicing at home rather than when you're out on a trail hiking or something like that. Um, so once you put that in, you, you, Put in the species, you can add a photo, um, choose species detected or not detected, and then save that record. And then you can go in and upload that record. So when you when you create the records on your phone, it's just kind of saving it on your phone for you, for it to go into the um, online collaborative database for Tom and other partners to see, you actually need to upload that record. So if you click, if you check off the records that you've collected and then go to the main menu and click upload selected, that's how you actually get your records into IMAP. Um, and if you've done that for practice, then you'll be all set. Um, and then you can kind of, you don't have to do that setup again. Um, you'll kind of just be ready to go out into the field. You might not have good internet connection, but you can collect your observations add your photos, super important for confirmation. And then whenever you get home, you can upload any records that you've collected. And I do want to note that those photos are really important. So um, focused close up photos are really helpful. So on the left hand side, I have a blurry photo and a more far away photo. Um, you might be able to tell that they're tree of heaven by squinting at them but it's really much easier with the photo on the right. You can very quickly tell that it's Tree of Heaven. Um, and we understand that the you can't really control the lighting outside, the wind might be blowing. Um, so we just kind of ask people to do the best they can. You can put your hand behind a branch to help it focus or a piece of paper, um, that sort of thing. And that was a really quick overview. Um, we do have step-by-step -step guides, both in PDF and also in video. Um, so we encourage you to go to our report page. Um, you can just go to our homepage, um, nyimapinvasives.org, and click on our report tab in the main menu. And then once you have IMAP figured out, um, the one thing left to do is to actually go out and do those surveys. So what we generally rec recommend is that, um, so if you select a grid square, that's a one kilometer square, um, which is kind of a big area. We don't expect you to survey the whole thing. We just ask that you find at least one spot. You could do a couple instead, um, just some spots that are within your comfort level um, and that you have access to. And so then once you're in those locations, you then survey for spotted lantern fly and tree of heaven, thinking about some of the tips that Tom has shared. So you can find tree of heaven on flat surfaces, natural and man-made. Um, they're attracted to tree of heaven. Um, younger, the, the nymphs are attracted to, to more 
smaller uh, plants. Um, and then once you've done your surveys, then you report back to IMAP what your findings were. So if you encountered any of the species, you would report a presence record. Um, but if you, even if you didn't encounter them, we still like that data too. So um, whenever you go to a spot, you can, you can do a record for Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly, even if they're both not detected. And one field we do ask people to fill out is the time searched. Um, that can be really helpful for um, assessing the search effort and uh, keeping track of how much, um, quantifying how much work our volunteers are doing um, to kind of give you credit for that. And we recommend generally spending at least a couple minutes in a certain location. And uh, one, one, some tips for finding your grid square on the ground. Um, so say you claim a grid square, two weeks later, you're ready to go out and do your surveys, but you, you need to figure out how to, how to actually get there. Um, so if you need to go back and refer back to which grid squares you claimed, um, we encourage you to go back to the sign up map and there's a find my grid squares option where you can put in your person ID, which I showed earlier, and it will pull up what you claimed. Um, there is an option to print that. You can also change the base map, turn on different layers, um, and then just use that map to kind of pick out some places to survey. And one thing I really want to emphasize is to just do your best. So these grid squares are to generally direct people to areas where we need help surveying. Um, if you do your surveys and you're actually a couple feet outside of your grid square, um, that's, that's not a problem. We, we're just trying to get direct people to the general area. Um, as long as you're putting in surveys in that general survey, that's super helpful and we really thank you for participating. Um, and I did also just want to reiterate that our grid square sign up map is separate from IMAP itself. Um, so if you go in and log into IMAP, you won't be able to see your grid squares there. That's on our SLF webpage. Um, so just to reiterate, um, what we ask our volunteers to do is create an IMAP account, select a grid square if there's one in your area you're willing to survey, um, prep, do the prep work, so test out IMAP, pick out where you want to do your survey, and then actually go out and survey um, for a spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. And those uh, steps are laid out in more detail um, on the website. And again, we do hope that people submit reports a couple times throughout the year. Um, so at this point, that would be maybe once in summer, if you have time in the next uh, probably one or one-ish week. Um, if you have time to go out and do a survey this weekend, that'd be great. Um, and then also a survey in the fall. And just to remind you, there's all sorts of resources on this. I know the Ag and Markets webpage has info on Spotlight Interfly and the IPM website, and I think those links have been posted. Um, but we also have some resources more geared towards this particular volunteer effort on our nymapinvasive.org slash SLF webpage. And um, also I listed my, my email there. Um, and so on the webpage, it has information on how to use IMAP, how to sign up for a square, um, resources for identification, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, so there's our email. Please feel free to email us if you have any questions. And with that, that was everything on our agenda today. Um, so hopefully we all learned a bit about how to identify spotted lanternfly, identify tree of heaven, how to use IMAP, um, how to select a grid square if you're interested, and how to be ready to do your surveys. So with that, I'll just reiterate our take-home messages. So from Tom, he mentioned that a negative survey is always good, like those not detection records. Um, our invasive species biologist says, before heading out, refute, review your grid map for spots that are safely and publicly accessible. And then my take home message is to submit and upload a fake species record before you go out and do surveys. And before I closed, I wanted to show the PRISM map. So I mentioned these partnerships for regional invasive species management earlier. Um, these are really great resources. They have um, a lot of programs going on throughout the year. 
um, I really encourage you to figure out which prism you're in and uh, follow them on social media, go to their website, um, however you'd like to connect with them. And with that, that's all we have. Um, please enter any questions you have into the chat. Um, thank you all for joining us. And we can go through any questions that we haven't answered yet. Um, so I see one new question about those little orange bumps on the head of spotted lanternflies. Tom, are those its eyes? The eyes are above that. I believe that's a hearing structure, hmm. but uh, or, or like their antenna. Uh, I'm not un entirely sure on those. I believe that's part of their antenna. Um, it's not their eyes. So you got that's the first time I've been asked that question. That's a good one. So uh, I'm gonna do a quick search right now and try to figure that out and respond in the chat if I can. Um, I'm pretty sure that those are. Uh, basically like antenna, um, but I'm, on, I'm only like 80% sure of my answer on that one. Okay. Uh, and I think I've answered all the others in the chat um, in detail, but if there's, if I missed the question or you know, if I misunderstood the question or I didn't answer it fully, um, you know, just let me know now in the chat in the Q&A. Yeah. Now, stop our recording.